Marhaba Sarab and Salam Nikfat. Thank you both for being a part of this. Now, I guess we'll jump into our questions. So Nikfat, could you please share with us your cultural background and tell us a little bit about your journey to Australia? Yeah, um, as Iko introduced me, I am Nikbah Wahidi from Badakhshan, Afghanistan. And my culture background is Afghanistani. And we got the beautiful dresses for ladies, which we wear. And uh, back in Badakhshan and in Afghanistan, ladies wear dresses and men's wear, you know, normal suits and clothing that they wear here. And interestingly, my first poem was about dress, a red dress from uh, Badakhshan, Afghanistan. <laughs> and uh, that's, and also we got the beautiful uh, food, which is the national food of Afghanistan, Palau. And that's a little bit about my culture and about my journey and struggles of uh, being refugee. So I was very young when uh, my family migrated to Pakistan and we were living in Pakistan illegally and we were struggling uh, by getting access to literally everything, even the basic thing of knowing uh, where things are, where the shops are, where we can get house and uh, also where we can get help. And we didn't know anything about, you know, getting help from uh, humanitarian from other countries or we could move out to, uh, you know, countries of the first world. And we, we so the access of knowledge and knowing things um, around us was the biggest challenge as well as language and, you know, relationship, connection to the country, and so many other challenges. So, um, yeah. Thank you. So, Rob, how about for you? What, what was your journey like coming to Australia? So, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. My name is Sarab, as Echo mentioned, and I'm a teacher and coordinator at a language school in Sydney. I work mainly with international students and migrants coming to Australia. I have a lot of shared experience with them, having gone through it myself. Um, I was born and raised in Baghdad, Iraq, to a Christian family. Uh, most people don't know this, but uh, Christians are a minority in Iraq. Prior to 2003, it was about 3% of the country, and now it has lessened a lot during the uh, in the more recent years. Um, so uh, some of the challenges uh, I faced, I would have to say, because we have such a unique, you know, every refugee has such a unique experience and unique challenges that they've gone through. Um, language wasn't a problem uh, for myself and a lot of the other members of my family, but some of the challenges we faced were navigating an entirely new system. We talked about this previously about, uh, you know, getting your IDs to 100 and uh, navigating, you know, filling out all the documents, what you need to address first, because it can be a little overwhelming. Um, it took us roughly maybe eight months to almost a year to get all of our paperwork done to make sure to have, you know, all of our IDs. I would say those were some of the biggest um, challenges that we had. So I think for me, the biggest challenge uh, that I faced arriving to Australia was maintaining uh, the culture and family expectation uh, with the expectation that I could have for myself or the things that I could do. Just an example of uh, that's in our culture, uh, if you're the older daughter, you're just the mother of your siblings and you're responsible for, you know, doing uh, the housework and looking after your sibling and as well as helping your parents. Uh, so my parents, came from Afghanistan, they couldn't speak any English and I had to be translator for them. And I had to help them around, filling form, getting, uh, taking them, you know, to places. And I had to be just the main responsible in the family. So that was a uh, culture expectation that passed down from family to family. 
So um, that was one thing that I was uh, struggling to maintain that with uh, the rule that I have as a young person that I should be, you know, the work in the house should be equal to everybody and I shouldn't be just the one who should be responsible. And as a young person, I should do more activities and yeah. be mm -hmm. social and doing those young people's, uh, you know, jo uh, roles. So that was the uh, one big thing that I was struggling to maintain. So, uh, so by getting help around, uh, by um, uh, getting help from um, social worker yeah. supports. So we got to, I, I got to, they got to talk to my family and they got to get information from me. And, uh, you know, f uh, from there, they got to talk to my family and says that, okay, we know that this is a, you know, culture expectation and family expectation. But as a young person in Australia, you, uh, as a young person in Australia, you not only, uh, you're not only having the role, but you're, you should be doing all these things that young people are doing, like going and joining activities or spending time with yourself or, you know, uh, doing all these other things. So I think um, that was the one big thing for me to uh, challenge and get help and slowly those things change. And now <laughs> we go to... Uh, help each other around the house and mother father everyone is equally you know doing all these things around the house or with the family if my father or mother going to the doctor or somewhere they need translator they could uh, basically get a translator yeah, or form yeah. Yeah. translator or help around yeah that's really nice to hear that you were able to get some support to allow you to feel welcomed and someone was able to kind of normalise that expectation that young people are allowed to partake in social activities and interact with other people. So that's fabulous to hear. How about for you, Sarab? Um, I would have to say that one of the main challenges I faced, um, I think, was someone who already had a strong command of the language. The language wasn't a strong barrier for me. But uh, one of my biggest challenges was getting my degree recognised. Uh, in in such a way where my international experience would count, would be accounted for in Australia, and unfortunately that didn't really happen. The process of recognizing my degree for someone who could already speak English was already difficult. So as you can imagine, for someone who um, has a degree abroad and coming here and going through the process, especially as a teacher, it's an extremely strict um, you know, process, and I appreciate that because that means, you know, teachers are held at a high esteem and it's not very easy to become a teacher here. Um, but at the same time, uh, access to information was a little bit difficult. I had to call the Department of Education several times. I don't, I think they probably knew me by first name basis. Um, so I had to call them several times to ask them lots of questions. Um, even with regards to IDs, I had to wait until I have a certain number of IDs in place because when you arrive here as a refugee, uh, you don't have enough identification to apply for things that amount to 100. So you have to wait and get your Medicare first and then get your driver's license or anything else from, you know, service NSW. Then that could you be, you know, in the process of collecting, which takes time, um, getting your, uh, you know, working with children uh, check. I remember I called once and asked them about that. They said, yeah, you can just get a volunteer one because you haven't worked yet went and got one, came back, applied. Then I was told, oh, you know, you need to get the paid one because you're going to be applying for employment. So then I went back. So even with Perfect. you knowing the language and, and calling several times, so as you can imagine for someone who, who can't do that or hasn't lived in, you know, a Western society that has a very similar kind of system where, you know, I lived in the States and I knew sometimes the processes in place, that can be very overwhelming for someone who's not exposed to that. Um, that was my biggest challenge. And I want to note another challenge I faced was uh, more systematic in that uh, sometimes I felt like I was being boxed into a certain, you know, kind of image of what a refugee is. Yeah. And standards were kind of set for me. Um, so before listening to me or before learning about my background and, you know, my uh, experiences and whether or not I already have a degree, um, there was a lot of probing towards, you know, would you like to study at TAFE or lots of other things that 
could be suitable for some people, um, but if you listen to the person, then you can give them more personalized advice. Uh, for me, you know, I didn't necessarily need to take a course at TAFE because I already had a degree from an English-speaking country. I already had experience teaching abroad, which means uh, all I had to do was, you know, get my degree recognized, figure out where I can seek employment or how I can seek employment. Um, but, you know, being grouped, I think, is, is, is part of the, you know, issues that might come up from, like, dealing with uh, a lot of people uh, and thinking that they probably all want the same thing or they probably all have the same goal. I would say that, yeah, I would say that was one of the things I, um, that was a challenge for me. Yeah, so when first time we came to Australia, obviously we didn't know anybody here except one uh, family friend here. Then we got help from SSI, CMRC, which helps young people, young refugees here in Australia and um, other organizations like START. And th these were the organization that helped us, <coughs> excuse me, help us, helped us helps us to settle here, to uh, show us the ways and uh, to get us to know how to enroll to uh, in the school and using transport and all other informations that we were very, very new to all these things that the first world has. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really amazing to hear that you, you had those supports. For you, Sarah, what, what were your services? Um, support? Yes, I also had access, of course, to uh, Settlement Services International. They came and picked us up from the airport. But I should know that my sister already lives here. She was our sponsor for our visa application. So that was our main uh, support system here. Um, but uh, Settlement Services International helped a lot in terms of all the, you know, tackling all the logistics. Um, they offered us rides sometimes when uh, we needed to take my brother to um, the hospital or for doctor's appointments before we could have our own car. Um, they offered us uh, translation services, and that was very much appreciated because uh, these can be costly. And uh, for future, you know, use when you're applying for your citizenship or anything else, you would need those documents. So that was very good. There was also an orientation for newly arrived refugees to talk to us about, you know, how to pay your bills, uh, can you drink tap water, things like this that are um, extremely important in like everyday, um, you know, life information. Uh, con liaising and connecting us with other services like uh, Centerlink, for example, so you can, you know, seek support until you find employment or for uh, job seekers, uh, language if you needed uh, needed that as well. Um, so yes, these were the, our main two support systems, my sister and um, SSI. Yeah, um, I think identity is important for all of us, uh, but for me personally, uh, other things that I do is more important than my identity as well as keeping uh, those traditional practices, culture alive is uh, important, important to the identity. So uh, I think identity uh, can be changed by time mm -hmm. as we live in a new country or as we uh, grow and as we just <laughs> just step uh, kind of step away from it like j just an example of where um, I come from our religious practice was very important to attend mosque every single day or to celebrate Eid or to celebrate Nowruz and other events where here we it it got limited uh, because of uh, the lack of people from Afghanistan and uh, the lack of time where here the, everybody is uh, very busy and Australia got its own uh, culture, its own traditions and events. So um, with that, uh, I believe other things that I do is more important than my identity, what I identify through cultures. Uh, through the practices that I do. For example, uh, me, 
helping me, uh, being someone uh, useful, me doing uh, other things would be more helpful of me identifying from, uh, with the uh, traditions or with the culture or with the um, practices or other things. Yeah. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. How about for you, Sarah? Um, um, for me, I would say um, the fact that I came here with my family um, makes a huge difference because that means I have a little piece of home. Um, and my mother lives here, which means I have access to homemade food. <laughs> Uh, so I would say I didn't struggle much in, in, in terms of that. Um, also, because of my religious background, I was born and raised, you know, Catholic. And I would say the majority of, you know, Australia it also practices very similar practices to us. Um, so that wasn't a huge, you know, deviation from um, our own routines, you know, especially around the holidays. Um, so if anything, I think that part I would say was a positive you know element for us because we didn't feel like we had to change dramatically you know our religious um, practices uh, my, my parents still go to church you know for the holidays um, the only thing is that it took them a little while until they could find um, a place that has a mass in Chaldean which is our mother tongue uh, because they just felt like they could enjoy that more and they could participate um, so for me personally that wasn't a big difference. I had already, I think having traveled to so many countries before coming to Australia, my my sense of identity had already been, you know, sort of, you know, tweaked and having to adapt to different cultures uh, repeatedly as a as an international student and as a as a refugee, um, I think helped me understand how I could, you know, adapt to this culture a little bit better. touched on this earlier. yeah yeah like as i mentioned before uh you know in our culture expectation has it passed down to my family uh the rule of older sister is that older sisters are responsible for their sibling and other things in the house uh including you know doing uh like <laughs> small things at the in the house, like washing dishes or cooking or getting uh, kids food ready or taking them to school or like um, looking after them and being responsible to the sibling and uh, to the family. Where here in Australia, a uh, young person, it doesn't matter, you're the older sister or you're the younger sister, everyone individually is responsible for their own thing, first of all, and second, that everyone uh, should be participate at home or uh, should be included uh, in the work at home. So that has changed since I got to know that this is not your role. This is just a cultural expectation from you. And uh, there from a social worker from CMRC, they talked to my parents as she got me to share my everyday routine and then from there she was like Nikvacht, are you doing this thing mm -hmm. are you the older sister yeah, this is like this shouldn't be like as older sisters rule this is just uh, expectation of your culture and your rule in uh, came from your country or from your family this isn't what a young person should do so from there it started to change where now here everyone is participate at home and even my dad cooks where it was a big deal back in my country that the man cook at home and it was kind of in those, those whole traditions where mm -hmm. ladies cooks and get things ready for their husband. So yeah, th that's, that absolutely changed from where I started uh, to be a mom and responsible to now that I am, you know, um, maintaining other things like doing activities or more focusing on myself or more focusing on my writing and more mm -hmm. focusing other things that I could do to the other people, to uh, the refugees, to the people around me than just focusing on one thing like a, as a mother of the house. That sounds like you're able to find your own freedom. 
Yeah. Mm. Of these. That's fabulous. Yeah. How about, how about for you, Sarah? Did roles change much for you? Yeah, I've been I've been nodding a lot while she's speaking because I think we have a shared experience in terms of um, the values we share when it comes to family, culturally. Uh, we're very family centered. Sometimes that can take a, a negative uh, toll on young people in the family because um, it can be uh, your role in the family can be largely infused with guilt and a sense of strong sense of responsibility uh, and and constantly feel like, feeling like you're not doing enough. And what that does is psychologically, it prevents you from actually seeking supports outside because you believe in your heart that it's your responsibility to be doing everything. Yeah. And you don't believe it just from yourself. It's because you grew up with that kind of narrative. So it makes accessing services uh, all the more difficult because you, you can't even fathom the fact that you're not going to do it and someone else would handle it. Yeah. So I want to speak to the idea of being a carer because when I came to Australia, our family dynamics were set around the fact that um, I have three older sisters and one younger brother. My younger brother has autism um, and he is almost nonverbal. So we, we're all kind of like co-parents in our house and we kind of grew up that way. So there's that strong sense of responsibility. Sometimes we joke in our family, we say we're like a corporate. Uh, we're like, you handle this, I'm on this duty, you know. Uh, so we've been doing that for years without any, you know, lines or uh, conversations of what that means to us individually. And when we arrived here and we had um, access to services from Centerlink, we had this acknowledgement of the role and it's known as a carer. And I think what that did was it gave a definition to something that we were doing uh, in the past. And there was not only no monetary compensation for it, there was no acknowledgement of what it means. What are the duties you have in place and how can you balance and navigate your personal life while you have this role? And to acknowledge that that is a real role that you're taking on and it's like a job as well. Uh, because be like prior to that, we, we never had that. Um, it's just an expectation. Yeah. So I think the acknowledgement of our the support that we uh, were giving to each other in the family was just acknowledged and it wasn't as blurred as it used to be. Um, and it helps us, it helped everybody in the family navigate that, okay, I'm, I am carer for my mom. That doesn't mean I don't care for anybody else in the family, but that just means I'm going to be handling her documents. You handle dad's documents, someone else will handle NDIS uh, for my brother. Helped us divide the roles in a, in a much more, in a much healthier way, yeah. I would say. I think uh, the first thing that would come in my mind would be connection. Connection is the big, biggest, important, uh, you know, role that they can start uh, giving their own experience and their experience of their working with other refugees and children and examples and connecting to this young person or the adult person who they are helping with. And that, the connection would be uh, one of the most important part, the, one of the most uh, important step to take. And the, another thing would be, uh, you know, uh, trying to get information to the person to uh, understand th their l l life and understand their needs. And then from there, the caseworkers could, um, you know, start to give the needed help that they need instead of handing the help that they might not need mm. or it wouldn't be necessary. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be the second more important steps that the caseworker could, um, you know, start uh, connecting with the people they're working with uh, and um, trying to get information from them. Just an example of that I mentioned before that uh, my family caseworker, uh, she starts just by a simple question of, how was your day? Mm -hmm. What did you do? Mm -hmm. What is your role in the house? And then mm -hmm. from there, I start to tell that, okay, I'm getting up, you know, five, six o'clock, <laughs> making my siblings food ready, I'm vacuuming the house and this, that, this, that. And then from there, she get she got all the information from me. Okay, I'm actually the man responsible for the house or for my stabling or for the things that 
happens in the house. And then from there, she went uh, to talk to my family and by just like, this is uh, the rule that Australia expect from all the people that uh, like you should give time to your kid as a young person and you should help and you should do this, you should do that by a, like a kind and nice way, not by a way that make the family be like, oh no, you, you, you just mm. m making a new rule on me and mm. <laughs> making me to do this, not by that way, just by connecting um, that, you know, this is this young person need this. This young person future gonna be like this if you put the time this. Just by giving information, and then there as has same time that uh, the caseworker would give information to my parents in ways to help me out in the house. Same time she would ask questions that what things would help you as a family that would make you to help your children and asking these questions while having the conversation and while giving information would really help uh, the caseworker as well as the family to, you know, just find a solution uh, as well as get information and get knowledge about what things are necessary and what things they can help with. Mm. It's really important points that you've mentioned there. So it sounds like um, from what I'm hearing, it's, Communication, clear communication, listening to what the what what the family needs, and yeah. being able to really have meaningful conversations and work alongside the family mm -hmm. to, I guess, make some positive behaviour change. That's really yeah. lovely. How about for you, Sarah? Um, I want to second everything that Nagbacht has said, yeah. and I would also add, and I think this would be something that would apply to everyone, but probably particularly with children. Uh, for, I know that caseworkers have really stressful jobs. I can only imagine, you know, having to deal with um, so many different types of, you know, traumas, uh, so many different individuals and, and making sure that you listen to them. So that can be a lot sometimes. Uh, but for caseworkers to do their absolute best not to make the person feel like they're an item they can check off of a checklist, um, because that's been my experience, I think, on the receiving end sometimes. I can understand the reasons for that. There are so many people to service. There are so many things that you need to do. So sometimes you just need to finish something and tick it off. And while they, that may be your system, it's so important not to come come across as if you are yeah. checking them off because that can make a person, and, and that's been my experience only a few times, it can sometimes make me feel like I'm a burden on that person. And sometimes I don't want to trouble them yeah. with more things to do. And I want to take on more things and, and leave them with little. So because I don't want them to feel like I'm adding to them. And that can change from person to person. I'm, an, I'm extremely empathetic. So if I sense that someone makes, is feeling like I'm a burden, then I definitely won't share more information. So I would say that can you know create maybe a divide or a gap if you, if you make that person feel that way. So to do your best to do all the background work without making the person feel like you're rushing through a thing. And, and to second what she said as well about, you know, providing personalized help. And the only way to do that would be to listen to the person first. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, I, I came to Australia. I already have a bachelor's degree, again, from an English speaking country. I sat down with, with uh, someone and they asked me questions about my English and they said, um, you know, do you speak English well? And I said, oh, you know, if you had already asked me about my education background and they started talking to me about Navitas and the English courses they're provided and I felt like that time could have been allocated to service someone else who needs that kind of service. Yeah. Whereas if they had known about that, they could have helped me with, um, you know, immediately with like how to recognize my degree, how to find meaningful employment. Someone also sat with me and showed me how to apply to jobs online, which which I thought like, if you yeah, if you knew then then it, you would know that it's irrelevant, and then that way you could help me with only the things I need help with because I also don't want to waste that person's resources and their time mm -hmm. where they can be using that to help someone else with other things, you know. Absolutely. So just listening more and and to also add to you know specifically with children. Um, not not treat the child not look at the children with the adult eye and what i mean by that is that 
probably a lot of what these children have gone through, it's the norm for them. And that was my experience. When the Iraq war started, I was 10 years old. So a lot of my experiences I could only recognize later when I became an adult that they were things that impacted me and how they impacted me, what kind of trauma I have now as an adult as a consequence of these experiences. But when I was a child, I talked about them so nonchalantly as that's just my life, you know? So to them, it's the norm. If you treat it as if it's not the norm, to them, they may not, you may not be able to connect. So just listen to whatever they feel is normal. That's their norm. You can't change that. You having not had that experience, of course, you know, you can be taken aback or think, oh my goodness, this child has, has been through so much. That child's not aware they've been through so much most of the time. And they may be described as strong and resilient and patient, but they, they just were brought up to have these things as a consequence of the experiences that they've had in their lives. Yeah, I think I have answered that question just with other question. Yeah, uh, by communicating and by uh, listening and trying to uh, uh, trying to ask questions to uh, get information from them, mm. from them, and then from there they will know that what helps they, they would mm. do. Uh, to the person or helping. I think I have already answered what, that yes. question. Yeah. Tailoring your support to, you know, the family's needs, yeah. providing psychosocial support when you feel it's necessary or appropriately. Yeah. Um, and the only reason, the only way that that can happen would be to listen more yeah. and, and, and also ask them normal life questions so that uh, that's what you, you can get a lot of information and, and connect with, especially if it's a child, you know, uh, you can connect with them a lot more if you just ask them generally about their day and then they feel comfortable and familiar enough with you that they can give you more information, which, you know, with your expertise as a caseworker, you'd be able to deduce a lot of you know, things and know how to tailor your support. Absolutely. Yeah, and also I think the one, um, the one most, another one would be that uh, giving your side to them, uh, by that, I don't mean that to tell them all about yourself and the things that mm -hmm. you do. Just a little one that's like, you're not the only person who's mm -hmm. facing this thing. Yeah. And you're not the only person who experienced this thing. Just, you no know, one. have yeah. a have a friendly, as they are, kiss worker are, having always friendly conversation. And if with that, they share that, you know, when I was young, I, I was like you. And, you know, this was the the things that was bothering me or I was mm -hmm. struggling and this is how I, I would get help. So from there, you could give a clear image to the person who needed help that, okay, this person had uh, this problem or uh, this need and then that's how she's sick for help. Mm -hmm. That's how she got help. And then I can be the next one like, that, like her uh, trying to, like her getting help so there she would be more comfortable the person who needed help would be more comfortable that first of all i'm not the only person second of all she would be comfortable with uh giving the things that she would need uh, she would know she would get that clear image of okay there would be help mm -hmm. my problem would solve or i would get this thing or i'll get that thing and in the end i, I would not he, it wouldn't last forever so I would get a solution the, the things that I have from the caseworker as she already uh, shared her experience or share a story even like yeah. some caseworker if they don't have the same you know uh, experience they can uh, as they talk to the person they can just make something up it's not you know just try to build a relationship yeah. Yes, so it's yeah. not one-sided, you know, of like course. you're interrogating or interviewing That's someone, right. you know? It's not coming across as we're interrogating, because yes. quite often, you know, DCJ, when we are trying to be involved in a family's life, we can at times ask questions that may come across as we're interrogating, and, mm -hmm. and some of them can be quite intrusive questions. Yeah. So it's yeah. really good tips to try and be personal and try to build a rapport with family. Yeah. Thank you both for sharing. It's it's so fabulous to, to hear from both of you, and for you both to share your your journeys you know that's it's, it's really really interesting to hear thank you thank um, 
I was going to ask, before we finish, is there anything else that either party would like to add? Um, I would like to add, this is something I feel very strongly about, both as a refugee but also as an educator. Um, in order to debunk any stereotypes we have, not only just about the stigma with, you know, the word refugee, but people who are entering this country from other countries, because everybody has, you know, ideas and, and, you know, any, like, preconceived notions about people coming from a different country, whether it has to do with, you know, the food or religious background or anything like that. Um, just to do our best to think about what access, if you're someone who lives in Australia or you've had access to a lot of things in Australia, to think about reflect on all the things you have access to and how can you ensure that other person has access to them instead of thinking how can I assist this refugee because again that could be you could be boxing up that person and then you know giving them a tag that not everybody is comfortable with I mentioned this to you earlier in my own family my sister is not comfortable with this uh, hashtag because it has not served her very well yeah. in her own you know career because uh, it would mean that you always questioning wait was I offered this opportunity because I'm qualified or someone said we need a re someone from a refugee background in this? And that's not a good feeling to have, especially if you yourself are actually qualified person. But now you'll never know. So I think sometimes it can have a negative impact. So to empower people and to help them find their freedom, which is our theme this year, it would be better to think about what do I have access to examine what you have access to in this community and how can you empower someone else to also have access to the same things? That would be the best way, I think, to to help, you know, debunk whatever stereotypes we have. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Now, before we finish up, Nick Buff has a beautiful poem that you would like to share. So, as I said before to you guys, that I was... <laughs> planning of doing six minutes <laughs> poem, but because of the consuming of time, mm -hmm. I will do just maybe this poem is for one minute. And uh, so, <laughs> God, so this poem, uh, first I just want to give a little clue of what the poem would be about. This poem is about me missing um, my country, and missing all the things that I had, like uh, just yesterday I was telling to Hiku that, you know, like even though I was so excited to leave the country and I was so excited to experience new things and go to another country because it's such a, like, uh, it was such a, it is still such a beautiful thing for me to, uh, go to another places and meet new people. But once I left, I I got I got to know the value of the things that I had. Where back in uh, Badakhshan, I was like, okay, it's a war country. I I don't have access to this that. As a girl, I don't. Uh, I'm missing this all these opportunities that I could have. So I would I was just into. Uh, just uh, having all these uh, negative uh, thoughts and all this image of me being disadvantaged. When I moved in, I get to know that there are things that there was more beautiful than all those disadvantages. There was things that was making me happy and I start to miss all those things and I start to identify them and I start to recognize them. And then that's how I start to uh, write uh, this poem about me missing my childhood and my country. So I will just read it for you all. I miss them. I miss my country, my place where I was born, my age when I was a kid, my friends, my cousins. I was always playing with them. The garden where I always went to play and eat from my beautiful trees, apple, apricot, cherries, and all different things. I miss drinking water from the white cold river. I miss the freezing morning sitting around the fire, listening to the stories going up to the mountain, wishing to touch the clouds. Hot tea in cold weather 
waiting for the sun to come out, looking for a way to go out with your friends, running, running to your friend's house and never looking at your watch, never caring about time, never caring about getting tired, coming late home thinking of a reason for one hour. I miss all of them. I want to go back to my hedge, my friends, and my life, and everything that I had. Thank you all. So that was just a short poem that I have wrote long ago. And since then, of course, I improve a lot of <laughs> knowledge and a lot of understanding of poetry and writing poetry. So that was that poem was uh, for my first collection of poetry. And I hope you guys all like it. Thank you so much for having me.